Okay, getting started again. The last um, integrity recording for this chapter. This is uh, hypothesis testing logic, where the thing we're doing here in this hypothesis test is called a single sample z test. We do a, a test, a hypothesis test, using the z statistic. We find this, the z score in a sampling distribution of means. And it's for a single sample. We don't have two samples that we're comparing against each other. It's one sample versus a hypothesized population value. So, not that you need to know that yet, but someday you might care about it. So let's look at some examples of null hypothesis testing. Let's say there's a study uh, that we do and we calculate the number of times, or we just observe the number of times 25 girls are off task. So we do this in classrooms sometimes. You sample and you watch and say how often the girls are off task in 10 minutes. And you say the mean number of times they're off task is 6.2 times per girl. So is that a lot? I don't know. So let's say we know that the population standard deviation is 15.0. And we would say, well maybe we know that from another study or something like that. We need to know that or we can't do Z. Um, so what if the mean of all possible girls, what if the true mean of girls of this particular kind in this particular class, whatever we're studying, the mean amount of time they're off task is zero. And frequently we have a null hypothesis value of zero. You might say that's ridiculous. Well, yes, it is ridiculous. But this is what we do in the field quite a lot. We have a null hypothesis of zero, and that's not always a realistic choice. So let's just go with that. Now you'll note that if the mean of all girls um, off task time is zero, then a normal distribution centered over zero goes into negativeville, which is crazy. You can't be like negative times off task. It, extra super paying attention. No, that's okay. We're not going to deal with that in the distribution anyway. So the null hypothesis mean now, the, the devil's advocate position that says, your theory is wrong. Your theory might say that something about these girls makes them off task a lot, but that theory is wrong. Actually, these girls come from a population. They're just a sample of a population of millions of girls of this kind. Um, let's say they're girls who play video games. And they were off, ta off task 6.2 times per per, t per 10 minutes. And so the null hypothesis says, no, girls who play video games are never off task. An average is zero. I know that's ridiculous, but there it is. Um, and so we specify what the distribution of all possible uh, levels of off task would be if the mean was zero and the standard deviation was 15, which we somehow know. And that's what it looks like. And we figure out that the standard error of the mean, the sampling distribution of means, is a nice little distribution with a standard deviation of 3, because 15 is the standard deviation of the raw scores, and the square root of 25, the sample, the sample size, gives us a standard deviation of 3 for that distribution. So our data fit over here somewhere. 6.2 mean. So in that distribution, of all possible outcomes, of all possible spreads of number of times off task if girls are actually off task an average of zero times, the video game girls, the probability of observing this mean or something more extremely different from this, so further away from this, is that little green, arrow, green squiggle there. That's P. And if it is less than, say, 0.05, then we reject the null hypothesis. So we can do P norm. We can say p norm, 6.2, which is our value, um, and 0, which is the mean of the distribution that we're trying to find. The square, the standard deviation is 15 divided by the square root of 25, and lower tail equals false, so upper tail instead. So the probability there is 0 0.019, 0 0.02. So if our alpha had been set at 0 0.05, we would say we reject this null hypothesis. This doesn't describe what's going on. We reject it. There's something else going on. Girls have, who play video games have more times off task than zero, which is a fairly trivial thing to say, but we do this kind of thing all the time. So hypothesis testing logic. What we really want to know is how close our sample mean is to the population mean. Confidence intervals try to address that for us. Not perfectly, but they at least ask the question. But a hypothesis testing doesn't. We do this backwards thing. We take devil's advocate logic. We say, we imagine the worst case scenario. 
of where our sample came from. Our sample didn't come from anything that looks like our hypothesis. What if it came from the thing that is totally not like our hypothesis, the null hypothesis? And imagine our sample mean came from that hypothesis. It's just one possible sample mean from all possible sample means. So it comes from the sampling distribution of means of the null hypothesis. Then any difference between our sample mean m and the null hypothesis mu sub sub naught sub zero is just because of random sampling. We happen to get a bit of an odd thing. I mean, there's always random sampling, and that's what this is. There's always random sampling error. So our question, our counterfactual question is, if our sampling mean came from the null hypothesis, what is the probability that it could be this different or more that we're seeing right here from the null hypothesis? The answer, that probability, is p. And if it's less than 0.05 or 0.01 or whatever we set our alpha level at, then we reject the null hypothesis. And we say that is not a plausible um, model of reality. So we just saw this in a little bit different way. Confidence intervals, we're assuming this. We're saying there's an imaginary population. And as far as we know, it has the same mean as our sample mean, because we don't know any different. Our sample mean is the only estimate we have of its mean. And that's where our sample mean came from, hence the, the pink line there. So imagine from that population, we sampled millions and millions of times with sample sizes that are, that are the same size as our sample. And then we took all those means and plotted them in a sampling distribution of means. And then we found the middle whatever, whatever percent. And we said, since our best estimate is that our sample mean represents the population mean, and the mean of a sampling distribution of means is the same as the mean of the population it came from, or was calculated from, then our sample mean we can just say, here we go. This is an estimate of its precision. So that, that width there, the middle 95 or 90% or 99%, is our confidence interval. So that's our best guess as to where the population mean went, or where it might be. It didn't go anywhere. So let's get rid of some of this stuff. Now let's talk about hypothesis testing. It's a different situation. If you have an imaginary population, sure, but it's not the population that has a mean that is the sample mean. It's a population whose mean is your worst case scenario mean. It's the mean that says your theory is wrong. In other words, it's the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis decides what the imaginary population is. And so we say our sample mean came from the null hypothesis. And so there's a m we do the random sampling thing over and over again, and we construct uh, a sampling distribution of means. And so we compare our mean to all possible means that might have happened if the null hypothesis were true. And then we figure out what the probability is of observing our mean or something more extremely different from the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis were true. And that probability is p, the p-value. And if we happen to be doing a two-tailed test, and it has to do with how we phrase our question, then we um, have to include in p also the mirror image of this side, because if we say, is there any difference between you know, these two things, or is this different from the null hypothesis value, rather than saying, is this greater than the null hypothesis, if that's what our hypothesis is, if our hypothesis does not specify a direction, then we would have accepted either something very high above the null hypothesis mean or, or low. So our p-value has to include both quantities. We kind of hurt ourselves by not being able to ask a good preci precise question. Anyway, that p-value, the probability of observing this or something more extreme if it was sampled from the null hypothesis, that's the answer, essentially, to our hypothesis testing situation. A calculation is really similar to the calculation for a confidence interval. You're just calculating a z-score. Choose an alpha level, 0.05 or 0.01 almost all the time. You specify the distribution implied by the null hypothesis. Specify means you say and write down exactly what the mean and the standard deviation of that hypothesis are. If it's normal, then that's all you need to do. Then you specify the sampling distribution of the means implied by that null hypothesis and by your sample size. So you write down the mean and the standard deviation, in other words, the mean of the sampling distribution of means and the standard error of the sampling distribution of means. And then you find the z-score of your sample mean in the standard sampling distribution of the means that was constructed with its middle, with its center, being the mean according to the null hypothesis. And then you find the area beyond that z in one or two tails, depending on how you've asked the question.
if the area is, in other words, p, if the area you find in those tails is less than alpha, less than 0.05 or less than 0.01, then you reject the null hypothesis. That's it. So the most critical value to find when calculating this is the z observed, sometimes called z obtained. And that's just the z-score of your sample mean in the sampling distribution of means of the null hypothesis. So it's just a z-score where you use the right values in the right sampling distribution of means. And so here it is. You just take the difference between your sample mean and the mean according to the null hypothesis, and you divide it by the standard error of the mean. That's it. After all that talk and that logic that you really should keep in your head if you don't want to fail a class, uh, the calculation is quite simple. It's just a z-score. So here's some examples. Ice cream example. Texans eat 50 ice cream cones per year on average. For some reason, we know the standard deviation of that population is 12. But in a survey, and if it goes 100 of residents in FAR, the mean number of cones per year is 42.3 that they eat. So do FAR residents eat fewer ice cream cones per year than Texans in general? Now, I'm going to tell you, this word fewer, because of the way we formed our research question, this means we will do a one-tailed test. We will not test to see whether FAR residents eat more We've committed to only testing fewer. So the null hypothesis, far residents eat no more ice cream cones per year than the national average. And the alternative hypothesis, which I called H1 instead of HA, far residents eat fewer ice cream cones per year than the national average. The math version is like this, null hypothesis colon mu of far is equal to mu of national average or something like that. You could do mu1 equals mu2, but it's easy to put subscripts and say what you're talking about. The null hypothesis always has an equal here. It's equals between the mean your your popu the mean your sample came from and the national mean. So basically this is saying your sample came from the national mean because the mean of far and the mean of national are the same. So they're basically the same population. There's no point in even differentiating them. We just write them this way. But the alternative hypothesis is the far mean actually came from um, a population that has lower ice cream con cons consumption on average than the national average. So that's kind of the mathematical way we write this. The far sample came from the far mean, the far population, and the far population mean is lower than the national average mean. So we can write down all this information here. We, the first thing we do is we draw a picture of the null hypothesis sampling distribution of means. That's the first thing we always do after writing down all the details and writing down the hypotheses and making sure we know what we're doing. We, r we make a diagram that looks like a normal distribution of some or sort of like that. And we put the mean and we label it. And we say mu zero. Mu zero is 50. The national average is 50. If the null hypothesis is true, then this is also the true population average of far ice cream consumption per year. The standard error of this mean is 12 divided by the square root of 100. So that's 1.2. The FAR average is 42.3, and we see it is lower. Now, we should have specified this before we collected the data. I kind of fudged and did this the wrong order here, but I do that a lot. So the FAR average is 42.3. It is lower, so our question is only how much lower. Is it enough lower? So we got that from a sample. So did this sample come from this population, or did it come from some other population? Is FAR like its own special thing? Does it is it a population with lower ice cream consumption, or is it just a population with 50 cones per year? That's our question. So we figure out the p-value here. We say, what's the, what's the probability of obtaining a mean like this, or more extreme, in this distribution of all possible means that we could find with sample size of 12, if the true average of far and everybody else is 50 ice cream cones per year? So what's the probability of, through random sampling, getting a mean as low as 42.3? Well, the probability, we need to, to know a z-score, or we need to use, like, um, p-norm or something. So we use the z-score formula, which works out like this, and we get negative 6.42, which is a ridiculously low p-value, or r ridiculously low z-score, which will give us a very low p-value. It's much less than 0.001. It's like 0 0.0050s zero or something like that. It's a very low number. So a low p-value, what does that mean? It means we reject the null hypothesis.
we reject the null hypothesis at the p is 0.05 level, p is less than 0.05, and we find support instead for the alternative hypothesis. Far residents do eat statistically significantly fewer ice cream cones per year than the national average. So here's another example with bats. So bats. So Dr. J, who you've heard of before, um, recorded the frequencies of 152 bat calls in New Mexico, 338.2 kilohertz mean. The mean for bats in Arizona is 39.1 kilohertz with a standard deviation of 8.6. So he's going to use that standard deviation because he needs a population standard deviation to do a z-test, and that's what he's going to do. So um, do New Mexico bats use a lower frequency for calls than Arizona bats? Lower. This is a one-tailed test. We're not even going to look at whether they have a higher frequency. We're just going to focus on whether it's a lower frequency. And our alpha level is 0 0.05. So if P is less than 0 0.05, then we will reject the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, New Mexico bats use the same frequencies as Arizona bats. Alternative, New Mexico bats use lower frequencies than Arizona bats. The math version, because it says lower, there better be an inequality in here. New Mexico and Arizona have the same mean. New Mexico's mean is Arizona's mean. The alternative hypothesis, New Mexico is a different population. It has a mean that is lower than the Arizona mean. So the null hypothesis always has an equals here. The alternative hypothesis can have uh, one of three symbols. So we write down all the data that we have, and we specify our distribution. The distribution that is the sampling distribution of all possible means from sample size of 152 that might have happened, that could possibly have been drawn from the population of all possible Arizona bat call frequencies, if it's truly just Arizona out there. And that mean has, er, that population has a mean of 39.1, as we know, that's the population mean. The standard error is the sample um, standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, so it's fairly small. Point uh, 0.7 more or less. Pretty close. So the New Mexico sample, we put that in the world of the null hypothesis and we say how does it fit? How likely is it that this should have happened if the null hypothesis is true and if New Mexico bats are actually just basically Arizona bats in another state? Then we say we got this from a sample, we want to figure out that probability. What's the probability if the null hypothesis were true, if Arizona bats are really you know, accounting for all New Mexico bats, if New Mexico bats are just basically the same as Arizona bats, if, they're, if their calls are the same frequency and, we, and we, this is just a random fluke, how likely is it we would have had this random fluke? A random fluke in which a mean from 152 bats would be as low as 38.2 or lower in this distribution. So we calculate the z. Our mean is 38.2, the population uh, null hypothesis mean is 39.1 divided by the standard error negative 1.29. So the p-value is 0 0.099. It's actually greater than 0 0.05. So it looks like a big difference the way I drew it on the graph, but don't be fooled. It's greater than 0 0.05, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We reject the alternative hypothesis instead. P is less than 0 0.05, or sorry, greater than 0 0.05. New Mexico bats, as far as we know, do not use frequencies that are statistically significantly lower than those used by Arizona bats. So as far as we know, there, oh, there's no evidence to suggest that they're actually different species or colonies or anything. So now let's talk about the cables, which you're getting really sick of, so I found a picture of them. The cable company. The mean diameter is the same as before, 1237 millimeters, standard deviation 124 millimeters. There's a new machine that's being used in the factory. Is it producing cables with the same thickness as all the other machines in the factory floor? Alpha level 0.01. They want to be pretty sure. So the sample that they take from the new machine, they take 250 cables. The mean of that sample is 1250, 1,250 millimeters. The standard deviation is 106.5 millimeters. So think of how you would set this up. If you want to really learn things, write things down, start to make the diagram, write down your information work things through before I go to the next slide. Were you fooled? Did you think I will use that sample standard deviation of 106.5 millimeters? Did you think it would be better because it's a sample value from the true sample? This is wrong. And here's a rule. Whenever you have a population value available, you use the population value. It's always better than the sample value. 
So we will use the population standard deviation, even though we have a sample standard deviation. We will use the population standard deviation. Now there are exceptions where you have to factor in the, s the, the sample standard deviation as well, but you don't just ditch the population one. And in this case, since hypothesis testing is all about the null hypothesis, we know the standard deviation of the null hypothesis distribution. So the null hypothesis could be phrased as the new machine produces cables with a mean thickness no different from average. The alternative hypothesis, it produces cables of a different thickness or diameter than the average. The math version, mu nu equals the mu of the others, or mu nu not equal to. Now this not equal to tells you we're going to do a two-tailed hypothesis test. We're going to find p in one tail, and then we're going to double it, and that's going to be our p, because we would have accepted. We will, we will reject the null hypothesis if this machine produces cables that are thicker or thinner than average. Either way, it's two-tailed because we will accept one of two possible outcomes at, to reject the null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So here's our data, and we specify the null hypothesis sampling distribution of means. In other words, the distribution from all the other machines before the, the new one showed up. Its mean is 1,237 millimeters. The standard error of the mean is the standard deviation divided by the sample size square root. So 7.8 is what we get the standard error. And the new mean is 1250. It's up there somewhere. Come from our sample of 250. And so the p-value that we're going to find is going to be the probability of observing something greater than this or equivalently less than this on the mirror image other side of the distribution. So the z-score, 1250, blah, 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 1.658. Now, if this was a one-tailed test at alpha equals 0.05, we would reject the null hypothesis. But it's not. And you can question whether they should have done that. But we said it was a two-tailed hypothesis. We said alpha was 0.01, so we do not reject the null hypothesis because this gives us a p-value of 0.049. But since it's, that's only in one tail, and since it's a two-tailed test, the p-value is the area here and the area over here. So, can you get out of my way, mister? Is it, that says 0 0.098. Um, so true p-value is right around 0 0.1, greater than 0 0.01, for sure. About 10 times greater than 0 0.01. I'm just going to assume this wasn't paused since forever, but I just paused it right there. Here, blah, 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 blah. Doobie, 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 doobie. The conclusion... We fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not enough evidence to conclude that the new machine produces cables with any different diameter. Um, not enough evidence by the criteria that we set up. We could change the criteria and redo it if we wanted to, but we've got to live with the criteria that you came up with in the first place. So, fail to reject the null hypothesis. P was greater than alpha. Sometimes we say fail to reject instead of retain. Um, there's, a, there's some variability in the phrases that we use. We didn't say anything about the alternative hypothesis here, and that's okay. Sometimes we don't. We just talk about the alternative, or the null hypothesis, because that's what it's all about. So here's another example. Um, from some survey data, it's known that the mean age of college students in the engineering programs at UTPA taken together, this, these are all lies, I made these up by the way, is 21.5 years with a standard deviation of 3.4 years. There's a person who thinks that mechanical engineering students are older on average. So he takes a random sample of 25 mechanical engineering students and he compares it against this population value that he has up here. He finds that his mean is 22.6 years with a standard deviation of 2.8. So, first test has passed. It, these people are actually older than the mean, that his sample is higher than, his sample mean is higher than the population mean. So, the only question left is how much higher. Now, if this had been less than this, you don't have to do a hypothesis test. His hypothesis test is that they're older. The sample is that they're younger. Okay, you're done. Go home. No test required. You're wrong. Your hypothesis is not supported. So is this hunch correct? Um, is it supported? Alpha equals 0 0.05. So null hypothesis, mechanical engineering students are the same age on average. N alternative, they are older on average. Math version, mechanical equals others. So notice that this is a population value. Our hypotheses are not about the sample values, they are about the population values. We only use the sample values to try and tell us something about whether this hypothesis about the population um, turns out the way we want to or not. So hypotheses are never about samples, they're always about populations. Alternative, mechanical engineering 
younger than, lower age than others. Oh wait, that's wrong. It's older than. Sorry about that. Let's hope there are no more embarrassing mix-ups like that. Okay, alternative hypothesis, mechanical engineering, these students are older than other students. So, we specify the distribution under the null hypothesis, the sampling distribution of all possible means for other engineering students. <coughs> because if the null hypothesis is true, that's also where mechanical engineering students came from. They didn't come from anything different. They came from this population. That's what the null hypothesis says, and we're evaluating how likely that is. So the mean of that, hypothe that population is 21.5 years old. The standard error, the standard deviation of that is the standard deviation divided by the square root of 25. Pretty small, 0.68. So the mechanical engineering mean is, is higher. We'll just draw it up here somewhere. We don't really know if that's to scale or accurate. That doesn't matter. It should just be on the correct side of the mean. You don't have to draw this when you do your diagrams. I just do this to remind you that this came from a sample, and this is an entire population. And we're going to find this area. It's a one-tailed hypothesis test because he knew enough to specify that they should be older. So our entire p-value gets um, located in there. So we have a greater chance of it being less than alpha, less than 0.05. So the math, we do the z-score. It works out to be 1.62. Oh, so close. The probability associated with that, the p-value, is 0.053. So we are greater than 0.05. Sorry, close does not count in this game most of the time. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. And instead, we reject the alternative hypothesis. There is no evidence that mechanical engineering students are older, on average, than other engineering students. So let's do another example here. And not an example. We're just going to talk about some more things. There's a big thing that you need to know, we really are concerned with quantifying and structuring the uncertainty we have in these processes. We do not ever know which hypothesis is true. You don't prove anything true. You don't prove anything false. You find support for something. You lack support. You reject the hypothesis, but rejecting it doesn't mean it's false. You just say, this is not the model that we will currently accept right now. So we don't know which hypothesis is true. We never know if we're right or not. This is not just statistics, this is reality, this is life. We rarely know when we're right and when we're wrong. So we could be at any given point making an error in hypothesis testing. This applies to null hypothesis testing only. Since null hypothesis testing ends in this very specific thing, you either reject or you do not reject the null hypothesis, then it's a pretty clear cut thing to make little tables out of that are two by two tables. We don't know whether our decision is an error, but we can calculate some of the probabilities over time of whether our decision might have been the error. So we often make a table like this. Now sometimes people put reverse these and reverse these and put this on this axis. I don't know, maybe there's a standard way to do it. Anyway, because we reject or retain the null hypothesis, our decision is, is just yes or no. You reject it or you don't reject it. In reality, however, which is not necessarily correlated at all with your decision, Either of those two things could be true. Either we should have rejected it because it's the alternative hypothesis is true, or we should not have rejected the null hypothesis. We should have retained it because the null hypothesis is true. Now this leads to a little matrix of errors and correct decisions. So if you retain the null hypothesis, and unbeknownst to you, it was actually a true null hypothesis, your, your theory was false, and the null hypothesis was true, which you'll never know, but if that was going on, then you made a correct decision. But if you retain the null hypothesis, but in fact the alternative was true, that's just sad. You totally missed an opportunity there. You should have done something different because the null hypothesis was not true, but you concluded that you had to retain it, and you rejected this alternative hypothesis, but the alternative hypothesis was true. This is called a type 2 error, and the value of, prob of the probability of that happening is called beta. So when we say beta, we mean that's the probability of a type 2 error happening. A type 1 error, the probability is called alpha. And this is usually the worst decision. It, it usually has more destructive consequences than this. Not always. So it's no, it's no um, coincidence that this is the area in the tails. It's, we specifically decide on the probability of a type 1 error when we say alpha is 0.05. We have guaranteed the probability of a type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true. 
It's a conditional probability. So this is when we reject the null hypothesis, but in fact it was true. We say, woohoo, we found something, but we are blowing smoke. We are like those people who found cold fusion in the 90s or whatever. They were like, woohoo, we found something. Turns out, no, they didn't. False alarm. And that's embarrassing. And it's also um, usually pretty destructive to science. Now, if you reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis was false, in other words, the alternative hypothesis was true, this is another correct decision. And that's where we hope we end up. Keep in mind that we know exactly what alpha is by because we decide. We say alpha is 0.05. That means if the null hypothesis is true, then under those conditions, we have a 5% probability of, correct, of rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it was true. And you can think through this if you want, but it makes perfect sense. Um, the probabilities of these things happening vary depending on whether this happens or whether this happens. So if somebody says, if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of a type 2 error? Zero. You can't have a type 2 error if the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis is true is only this row. Type 2 error can't happen. If somebody says, what's the probability of an alpha or of a type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true? Well, that's alpha. But if you retain, or sorry, if you reject the null hypothesis, if you retain the null hypothesis, what's the probability of a type 1 error? It's impossible. Type 1 error only happens when you reject the null hypothesis. So if you retained it or failed to reject it, it can't happen. So these are important things to consider. And we'll, and we'll deal with these issues a little bit more. We're very concerned with alpha, and we control it directly. Beta we control very indirectly, or we have some influence on. But alpha, we select it. We select alpha of 0.05 or 0.01. And in confidence intervals, you control alpha by setting the confidence level. Bigger confidence level is smaller alpha. Same thing. So, final question here. If you had access to all the data from the population, and you wanted to do a hypothesis test for the mean, what would the probability of a type 1 error be? And I'll leave you with that, and we're done with chapter 4.